Mike and I started, um, we were in architecture school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Um, and there was a study abroad program in um, to Milan, Italy in 2004. And uh, Mike and I were both in that class. And we went over there and we each had to study, um, like we had to take an independent study. We had to study something outside of the profession, um, but kind of look at it through the lens of architecture. And our professor, Neil Frankel, um, you know, really encouraged us to do something that was really, we were really passionate about. And so I had always loved going to the movie theater and kind of connecting architecture and film just in my studio projects. And so that's what I studied. I kind of was the hermit. I would, you know, really just watch movies. I would study them. I'd write about it. Um, and then Mike, who I had never met before, because he was a master's student, I was an undergrad. Um, he was on kind of, we got put at the same table, kind of coincidentally, and he was studying graffiti design, you know, because Milan is kind of sprayed with graffiti, all the walls, the canvas. And so he was, you know, using the, a video camera to actually go around and document his process. And so we just kind of started, started connecting. Um, and so I like, I taught him Premiere and things, and we started just to, Kind of do this on our own, but but a big moment was we you know the, our professor let us travel to all these different locations you know throughout Europe and one of them was um, Ranchamp and we went to Ranchamp and it was so remarkable this whole experience of um, all these people and the sounds and everything and um, you know I went back to the studio and kind of Googled to send my dad pictures of this amazing experience and there were all these kind of isolated photographs right with no people in them. It's kind of iconic building on a hill and had nothing to do with the experience that we actually had. And so, um, you know, I started talking to Mike and our professor, Neil Frankel, just said like, hey, listen, this is the future of architecture is to actually make films. And I think, I think you guys should think about not, not, you know, going in the traditional path and actually doing, doing this. You love it. You're great at it. Go do it. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to start we just decided to do it. We started documenting our own projects in school. You know, like I would actually, I made a documentary on Mike's studio project. And at this time, the very first Marcus Prize um, was announced back in 2005 at that point, And they had a jury deliberation. Jeannie Gang was on that jury and saw us kind of making films. And, you know, she had just finished Starlight Theater. You know, it's a kinetic piece of architecture. And she just said, why don't you guys film it? for me, <laughs> you know? And so Jeannie became our first client back in 2005. And we just said, we're, you know, this is, this is it, you know? Yeah. By the time Ad Adam graduated, you know, it, I remember you going to have that meeting with Neil and Neil Frankel, FIA is our mentor. And he was a partner at Skidmore, Owens and Merrill and at Perkins Will. But I remember that, you know, that meeting where he's just like, yeah, Neil said, like, we should just go for it. And you didn't, Adam was working even through high school at an architecture firm and has tons of experience and was like really proficient, you know, designing. And for him to talk to his boss and say, you know, this is the time. And the guy just said, well, wait, I'll give you some, <laughs> some pretty boring commercial work and you could lead that project. And he's like, hey, that, you know, that, the rest, I have my whole life, like I need to go after this. And I think for me in 2004, Neil Frankel told all the students, he said, you know, some of you guys, you might like architecture and you'll get an architecture degree, but think about it. You might be better off for the profession not being an architect. And that was revolutionary to hear something like that. And I remember when I, when I graduated, I had, because I have an engineering background, I was, um, building a rapid prototyping center for my old school. I got really into model making and I worked for a professional model making company in Chicago. And through that time, that was 2004 when we came back, I saw the immense, like, the immense direct communication you had with the partners. We worked with SOM, SOM and Helmut Jan and other firms and they're spending so much money on this finalized model that they're gonna to show to the client and it's like, as a person who was still starting architecture school, I could talk with Adrian Smith or Gordon Gill or, you know, and top project leaders and talk about the model, how it's perceived. And that also gave us insight to saying, film has even an, an immense a higher power than that because you're communicating with everyone, not just the clients, internally with your, your team, 
but you know, future recruits, students, other people who aren't even educated in architecture. And so it's like, it was such a, a lift off our shoulders to not figure out where are we gonna move to, who are we gonna work for, but we're gonna go after any project that we read about, you know, or get you know, pinged about from Arch Daily and go after that work and who's got the best stories. That's what's gonna count. That's amazing. It's a very nice like mix of engineering background, a little bit of architecture, architecture, <laughs> film, everything all together. Um, so what about Spirit of Space now? What's the team like? Who is it made of? Yeah, four, four essential people. And Adam and I, you know, we're the founders. Okay. We film and edit of all the films. And in around 2010, another guy who studied with us in Milan was an architecture student, Ryan Clark. He just kept getting more proficient with um, music production and he was working in the West Coast, wasn't totally satisfied with his working conditions and worked freelance for us making the soundtracks. And then, yeah, I think in 2010, he moved to Berlin for a couple of years and just, you know, went to the music scene there, grew, moved back to Chicago. And then he's been full time, I think since like 2012. And Samantha, who's doing all the production and organization and, you know, dealing with, um, the clients, she was a director of communications at Studio Game mm -hmm. Architects, and she was our main contact for seven years. And, you know, we saw Studio Game grow from like seven people to 120 people with three offices, you know, in New York, Chicago, and Paris. And S Samantha, over that the relationship that we had with her, decided in 2016 to come on board with us and really help us what we're not good at, you know what I mean? We're, we are artists and we're, we're really patient and just kind of happy filmmakers and, and we need somebody else to help us organize all that and to, to make it run fluid. And through the times we've been working with freelancers and students that we've taught, and here and there we'll have freelancers to help us film on a specific shoot, but we really wanna remain like a boutique studio so that we can kind of choose the work we're going after and maintain focus on that. And the freelancers that you choose are usually with an architecture background or a film background, or you really don't, you just go for the passion of, of filmmaking? <laughs> yeah, no, they have an architecture background. Yeah. Okay. For sure. I mean, okay. we, that is something that, um, you know, we have that, that niche, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're not out there making, wedding films on the side yeah. <laughs> what do you think like it's, you know we're really this is architecture it's our thing and we need right. people that understand architecture right. right there's way too many kind of commercial um, media production companies that you know mm -hmm. i mean that come in and you know really do these kind of yeah. some of the most stuff, yeah you know, it's, yeah it's I, not I, communicating I, the design yeah. Just one, or one last one quick thing. I think some of the most famous um, architectural photographers are people who came to the profession, you know, as an architect and got into photo sure. making. But the, so I think that's that's for us. You can learn these skills, and we've learned it while we were students and looking at YouTube videos and tutorials. Mm -hmm. it, it's the idea of understanding architecture, how to tell a story. That's number one. Once you got that, you can learn all these other skills. Okay, so so basically, let's say from an from an architect's point of view, what is the first thing that you focus on while filming for you to stand out to be different than the commercial um, filmmakers? How do you take it from an architect's point of view? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's it's not about standing out or anything like that. It's you know we're going for. Uh, I we do a lot of reading, and I it's just reading a book on Sergei Eisenstein and. He kind of it was it was revelational to me that you know he kind of talked about he always shot for naturalism, you mm -hmm. know we often say authenticity and things but it's really about going out and and spending the time to observe a space. Architectural photographers are like bird hunters, right? They go out, they look, they shoot. We're more like bird watchers, right? We mm -hmm. go into a space and spend a lot of time observing it, letting the cameras roll. We hit record, and we want to capture these very authentic um, experiences you know, that are natural to how a space is really used um, mm -hmm. and experienced. And, and so, you know, for us, yeah, it's not about standing out. It's about communicating the value of a space and what that space is really like. We want to try to bring that experience to everybody. Mm -hmm. 
But I do think that there's also like an extra element when, you know, we can talk to our clients and say like, can you send us your drawing set? You know, that's not something that a production company is typically going to ask for. So like, we're going to look at the drawings. We're going to be able to actually understand what we're looking at. Um, we're speaking the same language, but we're using film to translate so that everybody, you know, like our moms <laughs> or our dads who were trying to like communicate what the experience of Ron Champ is, we're trying to be able to communicate that universally because we actually, we really believe in design. We're all design optimists and we want to be able to share that value with the world so that everybody can understand when they're visiting these um, world famous buildings like La Tourette, it's not just an object, it's not a static object that should be observed as such. It's something that is designed as an experience, something that's immersive and poetic and emotional. And so that's why we need basically like these four partners to make all of this kind of stuff happen. So we need Ryan's music, you know, we need the camera work and direction and the editing skills of Adam and Mike um, to make these kind of things happen. Yeah, yeah, I, and that's, you know, like, we want to not be identified by a stylistic or, okay, they're gonna have mm -hmm. a pan, pan, you know, dolly shot, pan, pan, dolly. there is no rhythm and there's no, you know, the client's own iPhone footage that maybe the assistant is there on site gathering a, 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 an important moment with their client while they meet, that's so much more important than us saying, we gotta be there with this camera, you know, because people feel intimidated too. And, and the, the best part about our job is I've helped, you know, other friends work with some kind of um, more corporate or commercial work. And it's like, with us, it's architects and they're just doing their thing. They're too busy to be looking over our shoulder. Like, are you getting that? Are you getting that? So it's very, it's a great, freedom that we have in trust and that's why it, we want to be as diverse as the next client or the next project that they're going for and i think the one thing that that is our special sauce is ryan composing it's like a it's like a tailor-made suit for each thing it looks sharp ryan's thinking about okay what are we showing is the building made out of metal is there wood is there nature how can we use field recordings that you guys are on site doing or, or could he actually go on site Though that's the part I think that really comes through that if, if people see other films, <laughs> hi Lucy, they might, you know, that I think that the music- We're all, we're all quarantining at home here. <laughs> yeah, the, you can see her the, bird. I think, you know, the soundtrack, when you hear something that's originally made and, and custom made, that's what puts you at ease to pay attention and watch and you're not fighting. You uh, is, is this too over dramatic? You know, are we trying to, it's just we're, we're being patient and we're it's almost like we have a record contract with Ryan and it's I think that's a great reward for us that we can be with our friends and do this work on a commercial basis but still remain in this kind of artist's bubble where we are given that freedom and trust. I, I specifically felt that with the video for the Peter Zumthor project. At the very at the beginning, when you when you had the voices of like everything in the nature, and it was so like you can really feel like I'm there, I'm genuinely present in that project. So I was like, this is this is pretty amazing. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but but so, that, that's empathy, you know. That's yeah. that's how our brain works. I mean, that's mirror neurons. That's the great thing with architecture. Like I teach, and I try to tell my students, if you want your jury to really try to start to connect with your project, putting out some sort of static rendering or anything. Like it doesn't connect with people, right? True. Because everyone's going to see it from their own biases, their own perspectives. And once you put movement in it, it actually mm -hmm. starts to connect. Samantha, going back to what you were saying before, can you just, um, because you were talking about the, having the, the soundtrack uh, being implemented into the video, can you just describe, um, any one of you guys, um, can you describe the process of developing a film, like the step-by-step -step of how you go on with it? Sure, sure. Um, so most of our work is commissioned directly by the architect, um, but also, you know, museum curators or people who are hosting exhibitions or events. Um, so that's how most of it comes about. And it always begins with a conversation. Um, and then from that conversation, we start to develop what the story is going to be. And we start with absolutely, it's always about the story first. And so then we go through 
research and data collection in the same way that architects do. You know, like they find out what the site is, they get the program. Um, as Stephen Hall says, like, that's just so many bananas, right? You need to understand what's at the heart of all of the questions. And so we keep the conversation going. We try and spend as much time as we can directly with the lead architects and the design architects who were developing the design. Um, and then we go about figuring out what are the visual things, what's the moment in time in which we're going to be able to capture that. Um, and so then we figure out what are the tools we need, what's the timing, all the logistics and such. We get onto site um, and we usually spend about a half day just being there. And that's um, usually when Adam starts to sketch out a storyboard and we, that always comes directly from just the experience. So before a camera shows up, we're trying to have the experience that we want to relay. And that's always a very emotional experience. It's an empathetic experience, it's immersive. And so we have to figure out, you know, like how to plan that. Um, but we also have to leave a lot of space so that serendipity can happen. Because there are so many things that you just, you don't expect and you don't know are gonna be coming your way. So we might be in a city filming multiple projects for multiple clients or something like that. And we find out, okay, it's gonna to rain today. Like which one of these projects would look good in the rain, you know? <laughs> and then we maybe have to drive 70 miles and then we get it in the rain. And you know, like that's, a, that's an instance that really happened. Um, so we keep our crew really lean, usually um, just two or three of us on each site and just a couple of cameras so that we can really hide in the background i guess and be invisible because we also don't want to ruin anyone's experience of the architecture and if they see big cameras and big lights and like a big production van out front then that changes the way that they're going to act in the space and what we're trying to do is relay something where people feel like they're actually there by watching our films um and that's also one of the reasons that we do short films in duration too is that we can capture many different projects throughout the year. We can also attract a more universal audience, uh, more public, instead of like something that requires you to purchase a ticket and sit down um, in a theater. You know, like we love that experience, of course, but it takes, you know, many years to make one film that way versus the way we work now, we can be producing, you know, six films at a single time, um, which is pretty, pretty amazing and pretty exciting. And so um, then after we film it, which usually takes about three to five days, depending on the location, then we return to our home studios um, and the editing begins. And so a lot of times uh, Mike and I work together up front on the story and just going back and forth on like, you know, what are the pieces of the narrative that are that we want to focus on? And then um, Adam, we call him the master butcher, and he goes through and he like really makes it sing. And um, throughout the whole time, we're really, we're sharing, we're like using Telegram to basically like share soundtracks that inspired us while we were on the shoot, nature sounds, photographs of us on the site, um, all these things so that anybody who isn't there can have that experience too. That, that's one, I want to add that one thing as the rest of the architecture profession figures out, you know, how to share your screen on a Zoom call and whatnot. You know, we've been working this way remotely since 2006, before there was HD on the web, when every film we had to do was on cassette tapes and then transferred into the computer, digitized, and then put back on the DVD. And we figured out how to work remotely because we had to. Adam and I would meet up on site, we would have parallel hard drives, and then we could just send the premiere file back and forth to each other. And me being, you know, my home in Germany, seven hours ahead, it really gave us that whole globalized workflow and that critical distance, which the Eames talk about, and it's so important to not be under the politics, po politics of the company or the, the, the firm you're working with, a lot of firms that we've worked with or have people that are an in-house editor or even bigger companies like when we work with you know big huge global tech companies that we don't need to mention in this film that could pay <laughs> for a million like little film people to work with and you know they're still under the pressure and the politics of the company they're not free to be have that critical distance mm -hmm. and so 
even between each other, I have more of kind of a, a, like an exert, extroverted kind of ADH mind where Adam is much more calm, reserved, and has a focus. So even between us, he'll see things that I've edited and then he'll pull back and go back and listen to something that might be the keystone to actually kind of making a better story. And that's what's so fun. Because I wake up then the next day and I see what he did and it enriches the storyline. Right? What Mike is really that's saying right. is I'm the better editor. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, we're very serious all the time. It's true. Like, can't, can't tell. <laughs> all right. So, um, out of curiosity, what is the difference between filming an architecture project, an interior project, and an installation? How do you deal with them differently? Do we? Did you say do we? Yeah. Yeah, no, I... No difference? To me, it's all, this, it's, it's, it's all about finding what the story is. I mean, okay. are you talking about... Um, like how we film it or like how you, do you treat the project like how do you go about it yeah, yeah i mean it, I, it's the same from you know we we filmed an artist who was um doing an installation at moma mm -hmm. and she her inst her um it was just like a live performance installation and she made a, this pencil and she used the pencil we actually filmed the pre like prior of her actually making the pencil Right, it was like this kind of graphite thing in her home studio, mm -hmm. and so, you know, to us that was just as important as you know filming linked hybrid, which takes up a huge section of a city in Beijing. You know, I mean, it's it's all about communicating what that story is and, and where it's going to be placed for the audience. Mm -hmm. And I, I have that was really specific I, too because you know um, Torquasi was participating in the MoMA pop rally and the film was projected like, you know, 60 feet yeah, yeah, yeah. wide on the wall behind her. So while she was doing the live performance, the film was playing of her making the pencil that she was using mm -hmm. in her performance as the key instrument. And so, you know, that's a, that is a really great example, but we also spend a lot of time in studios, I should say, um, you know, while design process and design thinking is happening. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the like more different or more interesting elements of what we do that is really specific to architecture. Because when we can come to the table and be there saying like, yes, we've been in the room when all of, you know, these world famous designers like Wolf Pree and Stephen Hall and Jeannie Gang, you know, have been working and talking with us, like we can tell them, hey, someone else is saying this different or better what do you really mean by that and we can really help people communicate the ethos of their studio in a, in a unique way and wait i would just i would just add that um just as an architecture studio someone would take on a huge campus for a tech company and still also build a private residence or even a small day chapel or just an exhibition we do the same thing. I can remember one specific project where just the construction fencing around the project was more than 10 times the budget of what we're getting paid to film it, and maybe even more so, but that every project has its own constraints, whether it's a 10-year project, whether it's a five-year project, or only a weekend that we're going to be there, or under certain weather conditions because it changed, and always being an architect thinking okay that's the story these conditions make a challenge it helps us do something totally creative and i think that's the other thing too these aren't enormous bloated budgets they breed creativity in the dna of the design constraints in order to tell the story so therefore we can't do everything we have to work small very lean flexible agile and do it kind of under the radar. People don't even know we're making the films because we're using DSLR cameras. Mm -hmm. Even in the old days when we had the bigger tapes, which now it's kind of like come full circle again, where these things look very, very intimidating. People don't behave the same way. So it's actually better for us to stay within that DSLR room where people think, oh, he's taking a picture. He's waiting there a long time. I can't wait. I gotta get on and just do my thing. I'm just gonna do it. I don't care if I'm in the picture. Then we can film it. And I think that's what's such a joy that Adam can write a story, a, a sketch, a storyboard, and I'm trying to add new things that I've learned, research, new camera techniques, 
ways to process time lapses and all those things playing a role because you have time and mm -hmm. you have money and those are always the biggest constraint and that allows us to constantly make a new film each time it never gets yeah, boring i mean that's a good point i mean you know i have this amazing structural bone in my body that like when i get on site i'm, I'm going to make sure that we're going to walk away with everything we need you know to make sure we communicate it and then mike's always going in and being like hey man look at that weird corner up there i could probably hook up a time lapse you know like always trying to bring in that little extra mojo to, to kind of spice things up like we always joke that like if i were to make films individually they'd be really boring and if mike would make films <laughs> he'd be like the gift uh, exit of the gift it shop. would never get like, done it would never <laughs> get done you know, you know they have all these kind of crazy pieces but then it wouldn't work you know so it's a good yeah, yeah. And so um throughout your experience what are the things that usually the architects request like while you're working on the films, did they ever like jump in on, can you get this, can you do that? Or they just let you be? Not every, every architect's a little bit different. I mean, one with, with Jeannie Gang was our first client in 2005. We have 15 years with her. She can mm -hmm. say, wow. writer's theater, go. You know, like we know exactly what she's looking for. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Some clients like Stephen Hall really want our authentic experience. He actually doesn't want to see storyboards. You know, I mean, okay. we do them for ourselves to help, you know, maybe I just do it for myself, you know, to have control, but like, you know, it's, he really wants us to re to explore um, and kind of share our raw authentic experience of when we got there, you mm -hmm. know, kind of what it's like. And so, um, and then some architects do like to kind of bounce back and forth mm -hmm. with the edit and kind of, hey, what if we switch things around a little bit? Because, I mean, they've been working on these projects for years, you know, and we're coming in with just a couple months of knowledge. And so there is still value in, in that. And but, a lot of, yeah, go ahead. But we're also, we're, we're also trying to diversify and even in the location scouting phase or well beyond a project's construction, go in and be kind of, um, it actually started with us with Studio Gang as the Aqua Tower in 2008. We did a lot of the animations and rendering and we went out with our cameras to the actual sites where the undulating form of the balconies mm -hmm. was going to connect people's visual sight lines. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a very important time because we found out that our going out to the camera, having the design team look back at the footage, it actually informed the design to really make sure, is that gonna work there? Now we're under the L in Chicago and to check those things. So for us, it's, it's, it's exciting to be part of the construction process or even in the conceptual phase. And then other clients, some may come to us and say, hey, we need a whole website. We've got a whole, like many monographs worth of work. Where do we start? Okay, we're gonna start by, by the small vignettes to make social media clips or maybe backgrounds. And, and then it's for us to, to say, oh, you've lectured. You know, how can we use some of the footage we've created for a longer story where there's people talking to pitch for to win a new competition how can they use that to actually enrich you know their content on the website or their lectures or just to be able to to kind of keep up the legacy of the firm so because it's not like as soon as somebody gets hired they go to these places and understand the ethos that that's happened slowly and i think these films it's it's almost negligent not to be using it in your design process or to communicate because it's so easy it's so efficient and whether we do it or not just do it like you know like nike it's just there's nothing <laughs> else to say <laughs> i think you made some really you made some really good points in there mike yeah. just talking about how you know this is for history and whenever we're working with a client especially a new one they might be really specific in their original conversation so they might say like okay we have this competition that we're working on and we want to make a film and we're like okay but what do you want to do after the competition is usually our first question to them because what we're going to do is we're going to make a film that's going to work for this but if you're going to invest in that you need that to work for something else and so we're always thinking about how are we building up a longer story archive with all of these clients and these are things that we just like we host online so that people can access these anywhere mm -hmm. and what we found with our clients is most of the collaboration is coming far after we complete the film so it's coming when they're asked to do a new exhibition and they want to make a fresh cut or a fresh edit 
of a film, or they might want to combine some different stories together, um, or they're going out and promoting a book and they want to be able to use like specific poetic scenes that are in mm -hmm. a film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are things that we're always the most excited to do. And we always like jump to do those wherever we are traveling in the world um, to make these like special requests to make these edits so that we can show how the film can be used in lots of different ways, especially when it does come to like using it as a design process tool. So like, for instance, if you can watch a film and see how crowds move throughout a space. Um, mm -hmm. That's a lot better than sending one of your staff members to go watch a crowd <laughs> in a plaza <laughs> for 15 days, right? Like you can make all these observations by watching a film in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, and I just want to add one other thing and a, a way of looking at it that we're always we you have to do what's what's right, and I mean. Mm -hmm. It's not about looking for the quantitative likes and clicks you're going to get. And a really great example is when we work with Phil Enquist. He was the partner at um, the urban planning partner at SOM. He's since retired, um, but he wanted to teach a studio, or he got picked to teach an option studio at Harvard. And so he kind of he called me up and just said, "Hey, listen, I have ten minutes to present. I'm going to do it on the South Branch of the Chicago River. Can you, you know, put together?" you know, a two or three minute thing, just to kind of show what the river's like so that I can get students excited. And, you know, we basically just said, hey, Phil, you have a bigger opportunity here. If you only have 10 minutes, why not make a film that's 10 minutes that you interact with and what, you know, and, and we actually just put a camera on a boat on the Chicago River and float down and you actually talk about as if you were like a tour guide on the Chicago River, and, you know, and he's just like, this is amazing. And it was a huge presentation, it's 10 minutes long. He got up there, interacted with the presentation. But what's great about that is one, it not only became the most requested studio in Harvard history, but like the mayor of Chicago saw it and understood the value of the river and dropped a whole bunch of money, which got a lot of the boathouses that are on the river to reinvigorate it. And just like, it also became one of our, I, I even believe it's our most viewed film, you know, in, in the history of Spirit of Space. And it became a series of films about studying the Chicago River. And it was just like, just by wanting to get the best students and just understanding that, hey, we're going to go out. This isn't about trying to make some sort of viral thing. It's just about communicating a really important topic in the city. It ended up just being explosive. And Phil became such an amazing client because all the projects that we did for him were, were projects like that. They weren't, um, you know, one of them was Art in the City where he realized in Sydney, he was designing a master plan for Sydney. And the client wanted to just have simple like public art put out there. And he's just like, no, 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 public art can actually change, you know, put the pedestrian experience. And Chicago has three, and many of them, but like famous, famous pieces of public art in the in the world. We're lucky. And so we went out and made a film to show how public art can actually enhance the street life and enhance people's lives. And then he used that to get his client to understand, like, okay, we need best in good public art you know that's that's what you say i mean whether you're an architecture student or a, a, a practicing professional the most valuable thing you have is your time and mm -hmm. do it justice you know invest it there's no question of what is my return on investment what is my budget it's important because you're putting your time on there otherwise if it's not important enough to tell a story or to document it then maybe you, you should question why am i doing it you know, so that's what we say. Just figure it out. Hire someone, give at, allocate time and resources to people that are in on the process to document it, but just do it justice because it helps the profession. It helps people's understanding of the profession. And ultimately it's gonna make better work be created and built than you know, and let let it let the best story, let the best communication win. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to make sure, you know, there's nobody who really thinks that Art Vandelay from Seinfeld is like what the real architect is like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what do you think um, with the current situation that's going on? What's the future of, because so far, a lot of um, architecture studios are really going for film, like short films to portray their projects. And then how do you, what do you see as the future? Like, do you think our studios are going to go more for for film instead of like uh, just like images or 
What's your What's your opinion on it? You know, it's interesting. When we started in 2005, we were like, we need to get out there and try to get as many clients because by 2010, we're going to have tons of competition. Mm -hmm. 2010 came around. We were the only ones still doing this. So we're like 2015, there's going to be tons of competition. 2015, we're still the only ones doing it. So we're like 2020, you know, and we're at 2020 and we're still the only ones doing it, you know, and it's what's it's it's just it baffles me. Of course, there's other people like making mm -hmm. films or hiring media companies and things, but like to really be the only ones focusing on architecture, it just, we were talking about this the other day of how it just seems negligent that the profession is still not valuing film, you know, and it almost seems like they just want to go the easy route, you know, like, let's just get some photography, you know, like, let's just snap some pictures because I know it can go on a magazine, you know, or even just like the fact that um, most architects are doing live Right now, they're doing a lot of live things, right? Because they have to. But even that is like, it's pretty easy. You know, you just hit live and kind of have someone come on and talk. And it, there isn't that whole, you know, need of having tons of forethought of how we're going to piece together a story that can go way beyond this, you know, I, live. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, I just, a, a real recent personal story is Juan de la Mora. He's the studio, uh, the, the model shop director at Studio Gang Architects in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of asking him, I'm like, oh man, what are you doing? You know, it's hard to be in the model shop. You know, you guys can't be each other. And he's like, I got two hands, hombre. <laughs> and then I looked at his personal Instagram feed and he was basically in 15 pictures, which is still a story and it's a film, you know, that you, you see the Instagram thing. He was taking a, a normal noodle and heating it up and squishing it down, making holes in it, seeing the pattern. And it like, even over my shoulder, my nine-year-old son was like entranced and you wanted to see how did the noodle transform and make a scale. And it was like, hey, I got a table at home. I'm cutting models. I really believe that the efficiency of the way people are working remotely, which we've been talking about forever, people have buy, been buying, you know, um, Oculus Rift goggles and how can we present to the client virtually? Just, that's what I'm saying, being, having this big barrier that we need to be separated and isolated, mm -hmm. not everybody in the office all around the table, the ideal solution. It's gonna make people have to communicate in new creative ways. And whether that's making, prepping your pictures or making a little film with your phone through a model, scale model at home, I think it's gonna make it communication more efficient. And I don't think people will go back to saying, sorry, we all have to be in this staff wide meeting. You know, people will be responsible to kind of compress the time and tell an effective story because that's what we have to do in this time Dan, I right now so. yeah i also think that this is going to just amplify something that we were observing already there's a massive change in the way that architects are communicating with the communities in which they're building and people have you know always talked about like building from the site and understanding you know the uses for the building in the long term and things like that but if we're really going to be adaptable and sustainable in the way that we've always tried to be as architects, and if the community focused architects, which we've been following, which I think have been kind of setting the tone for architecture of our time, um, for them to be able to communicate, they do need good stories. And whether that's film or whether that's noodle photos and model, any of these things, they're going to have to just think about other ways to communicate. So I think that. Corona is just going to amplify that. Um, so let's talk about that. Can anyone just explain how the process was and just describe the project? Yeah. Who wants to go for it? We're all like, <laughs> we all love it so much. We're all probably like being kind to let the other person speak. Yeah. <laughs> but go ahead, Mike. I saw you take a breath first. Yeah. Um, so during we worked with um, Wolf Pricks and Cook mm -hmm. and he actually taught a, stu a bunch of students at Yale. I don't really mm -hmm. exactly remember the year, but their project was to go to um, first it was the ECB Tower in Frankfurt and to the BMW World in Munich and to the Museum des Confluence in Lyon. And their idea, their their kind of charrette was to design what would the building be in the function if his museum was not there 
-hmm. And so, of course, we took like a a day trip to La Tourette and we've always wanted to do that. And then we heard the story where Wolf Pricks met Stephen Hall as a young architecture student, barefoot, down in the quarters, you know, sketching in the catacomb area of La Tourette. And it was just like, it was magic. It was like listening to the Farnsworth story, you know, and between Nice and Mrs. Farnsworth. And so when we actually came back to film that project, then we just took a couple of days and went there and did the tours and got to see the monk who was there working there and show it to us. And we just said, we need to make this film because only a very few percentage of students who even get to travel to Europe, even mm -hmm. to make it on that one day on the weekend where you could go on a tour and, and go inside it's just such a small sliver. And that's exactly why we started the firm. You cannot have an, a phenomenological experience of a piece of architecture if you're never able to go there. So film mm -hmm. is the next best thing. And for mm -hmm. us, we capture everything, movement, static, waiting for the right light. And it's, you get lost in it. You get lost in the editing process, even though you've experienced, and you know that most of the people who are going to watch this film have only seen a couple, you know, images put together mm -hmm. and maybe that for themselves, they can have an experience. Maybe it's not exactly the, what it is, but that's still going to lead to a lot of inspiration for their own design process. And I mean, it is what it is. We know that by making a film of a piece of architecture, we're corrupting it in a way, but it's mm -hmm. a fun and enjoyable and it inspires people. So I don't, I'm fine with it. To keep going you know you said a good thing you know we were talking about this film and um you know mike had mentioned like hey even if people see this film la tourette but then they're driving by a brutalist building a different brutalist building you know on the highway or something they might that building differently you know that's awesome but i do remember when we were editing la tourette like you know when we we're filming you know we film a lot right and mm -hmm. we're obviously filming kind of in the sequence that we did in the building right so when you bring all the clips in the premiere they're kind of in the order of the sequence that we shot them, obviously. And I remember thinking like, wait, how, why is that clip after the clip I just shot? You know, like, and it started to have this mental game of like, how did we actually move through that building? It is kind of a maze, you know? And so there then became this idea of like, how can we relate that experience in the edit? So we started to shift even just in the edit of how you move through, the, you know, La Tourette and try to re kind of engage that experience with, with our audience or with the viewers. I wish yeah, Ryan was here because Ryan could talk maybe a little bit about the soundtrack. Yeah, um, I was yeah, going to add about you know, the soundtrack. That instance, yeah, yeah, that instance, I mean, he dug deep into his Yeah, no, Ryan went real deep. And, and you know, Zanakis, Giannis um, Zanakis had helped Le Corbusier design it. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's like the window panes and like this musical composition. You can like play him with the stick. I remember the tour guide mentioning to us, you know, and so like he really took those Zanakis um, compositions and kind of interpreted that with the light and kind of to make, um, you know, the own, his own musical score out of it. So it was pretty awesome. Yeah, like Ryan has this amazing ability when he's composing the soundtrack, he basically will like draw an elevation times of a building on a score. So, you know, like just imagine a window becoming a note or how long, you know, the duration of that. Wow. And so that's usually the starting place for okay. all of the compositions. Um, so that adds a lot of value. For us to be there and, and to see that, that beautiful child at the end who's just like humming and you're filled with joy to listen to that and you're just sitting there on the camera doing your happy <laughs> dance, trying not to like make too much noise because you're so excited. And it's like, you couldn't pay someone to, to do that or, or the family that I think they were, they, those people were not even on the tour. They were just residents of the area that were going for a walk with their family. And it was just those magical moments. Mm -hmm. It's it's just so special. And Ryan, to not to, to not have to look to a royalty for music and figure out how to compose, he feels that and he knows how to use special MIDI controllers or to interpret what's happening. And like having somebody who can just do that, that we have that relationship with is just pure gold for us. And it's so enjoyable. You know, in this moment, Ryan didn't get to go on site and do the field mm -hmm. recording with booms and stuff. But I mean, it's reciprocal. And that's what makes it so much fun. It's like being in a band. But how do you know, like, this is the moment? You know, because if, if I were there, I would probably stay there for like six months, maybe just 
<laughs> waiting for the perfect moment <laughs> to pass. So do you really rely on your gut feeling like, ah, oh, yes, it's the emotion that I'm trying to portray or how is it like? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it is, it, it's, it's a lot of the gut, you know? Um, and so we do, we do wait for those moments. I mean, yeah, we were, we, Mike is very good at getting people to let us do things that we aren't allowed to do normally, you know? And so we got extra time to film there, you know what I mean? Like it, generally you can only be there for one day and we got two and it was amazing, you know? And so like to be there when there's nobody there, to be there when there was people there, you know, to have this time to really just record and see that light come in or, you know, follow the, follow the monks and, and things like that. I mean, there are, you know, there, there is a lot of kind of intuitive understanding this space is important, you know, let's find the right angle and how to communicate it. But then, you know, letting that serendipity play and knowing in our gut that we got it is, you know, that's what it's really. It's, in Chengdu, in Chengdu for a slice porosity block, you know, Chengdu is in this valley. There's 22 million people living in the city around. And they said that it only gets sun from six to eight, to eight days a year, you know? And we did this in November, I think of, it was Obama's second election, right? 2012. Um, I remember filling out the absentee ballot on site for him, but we, our, our travel equipment didn't get, make it through customs. And we had a, we had to like talk to the, 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 the concierge at the hotel to try to get somebody to wait up there because we only had this limited amount of time. And for some great stroke of luck, we got to show Slice Porosity Bach with sunlight where you could actually see it on the site. And it's like, you couldn't plan that stuff. You have to just put all your effort out there and hope that, that, that you, you're, the opportunity will be met with the possibility. Final question of the day. What do you see for the future of your industry? With technology and with, with everything that's going on, what's the future? With our industry or with the architecture industry? No, it, with, with your, with your industry, like the, the filming, the visualization of, of architecture. Yeah, I don't, yeah, no, it'll be interesting. Like, I think, like we were kind of talking already, like how Corona is making people think mm -hmm about communicating differently and how I mentioned like in 2005, we were like, oh my God, there's gonna be competition. And 15 years later, there's still not. And so I don't, um, you know, it'll be, I don't know. I actually don't know. You know, I, I, I always told people like, oh yeah, there's gonna be more and all that kind of stuff. But I'm at this point where I just, I have no idea. I mean, Mike is actually the one who researches more kind of future technologies. You might have a better answer. I, yeah, I, I think that, that AI, AI and you know uh, 360 degree cameras um, and just different software like that that the drones are using to scan construction sites and to to measure things. Mm -hmm. That's that's to me the biggest potential because you might not still the the, the, the person the off the wall thinking the non linear way that we think to craft the story can still be empowered if we can't be there and multiple cameras are on the fabric of the construction site or the design field or model making. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, you know, I've even seen things like just in GoPro software quick, how they, how the computers can calculate where there's a face, where there's a movement and to make a story with some of the automated presets. I think that that, that has an immense power for us as designers to be able to use this stuff in an efficient way that, that, it, we should embrace that and still have, you know, have the control and write it out. Yeah, no, I believe it. I, number one, Zoom, the way that you can use films and without the low latency that it has and the quality, you know, we've, walked, we've used WebEx and all these products to try to review films with clients in real time. And I think that that technology that has the, the, the data that can go back and forth or how they compress video so that you can actually communicate with it that made a huge difference and people will they won't go back because it's more efficient when i've got an 80 percent quality to see a film or to see somebody i mean i don't even need to fly to meet the board of directors to present my project anymore i can do a zoom conference mm -hmm. you know that's a first class ticket that's a lot of 
it's, it's going to change. I mean, it is changing because we need to survive in this time. And even whatever happens in the next month or two, mm -hmm. we still are going to make some big changes of our structure of the way we're working that it's going to be too, it's going to feel too good to go back to the old way. Mm -hmm. I know it. Yeah. Yeah. But I, th I do think people might start filming some of the really old things or technologies or, yeah. you know, you know, like other pieces that maybe not all firms do, you know, like some studio ethoses do do things like take a block of ice and melt it and figure out how that carves something and then they film that. But, um, you know, like the noodle making and stuff like that, that's, that's a very specific studio ethos. Mm -hmm. But I think while we're all tracked at home and like we only have so many tools at our disposal, and then when we're sitting here thinking about what's, what are the really valuable things that you know, we're missing right now, I think we're all kind of going back to handiwork and craft and the essential creative arts that you know, everybody's like, I want to really see my barista again. <laughs> I really want to go yep. to the Met. I really you know, like, I don't care if I'm six feet away from people, but I just, I need to see I need to see something else and I need to see something else that's different. And so figuring out how that works and com combines effortlessly with AI, I think is going to be what the future is. Cause we have all these old historic, you know, grainy black and white photos of people being makers and the like overly popularized like millennial trends. You know, we, we, no matter what we are, a client or student or employee, employer, you know, we, we are all a unique relationship of hosts and guests. And it's going to require more responsibility on when you're playing the host role to provide impactful communication that's very thought out with the resources you have to, to give some of that, um, this ephemeral, tangible things that we can't actually relate to there to better connect us with that. And I think that as the guest, we need to put trust in the host that um, even our miscommunications can still build a connection to each other. And that's why I think that a great example is Adam and I don't need fancy software to edit. Our minds are both, we're both there filming it. We can mm -hmm. edit together by talking on a telephone and and we can describe and connect with each other. And I think as long as we don't take for granted being together at these special magical moments and for celebratory moments, um, we can empower the times when we're apart to, to better connect in a way that we never, we just kind of glossed over it and said, that's not as good as being together. But now we don't have the opportunity to make that argument. We have to, we have to revel in this time period and we need to come with unorthodox ways mm -hmm. to enrich them yeah. that they can be satisfying to one another.